share my screen and once I figure out how to do that. Um, Okay, can everybody see see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right, so I think today I wanted to start out by just giving kind of some a little bit of context for um, for like the work that that the actuaries that spoke with you last time and Doug as well that we do and how it fits it fits into the bigger picture of the business um, here at, at AIG. Um, and so I'm going to go through some just kind of basics about AIG and the life insurance industry. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the types of products that the actuaries on this call um, deal with specifically. Um, and then, you know, just kind of some general information about the types of questions that actuaries answer at a life insurance company. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Doug to go through the, the, the case study, which is a, a real life example. Um, I, I realize we kind of did a bit of that last time, but, but hopefully this will be a little bit more context that's helpful for you all as you're kind of in starting out in your, in your journey as actuaries and that kind of thing. Hopefully it'll help you maybe even steer you towards being a life insurance actuary. Um, I put, I guess to, to that, to that point, um, a lot of folks kind of mentioned how, how difficult it is to attract candidates to the life insurance industry just because it's not like a sexy topic, right? Like life insurance and mortality is not something that's, that's sexy to talk about. Um, so I, I put a few quotes that maybe get to that point. This first one, I detest life insurance agents. They always argue that I shall someday die, which is not so. Um, so folks don't want to think about, you know, the, pro the possibility of their death or the death of, of a loved one. Um, but certainly we um, deal with, we provide protection to people in their t in time of need. Um, and so uh, just another quote, um, getting life insurance is like making a bet you can't win. If you live, you don't get the money. If you die, you don't get to enjoy the money. Um, so again, just kind of speaks to the the fact that it's a product that folks need, but don't necessarily um, find it as attractive to, to put their money into. Um, then this last quote is just from Eliza Wright, who I believe was the first, um, it, it, who's kind of considered the father of actuarial science. Um, and it says, while nothing is more uncertain than a single life, nothing is more certain than the average duration of a thousand lives. Um, and so that kind of speaks to what we do with, you know, we rely on the, the law of large numbers to, um, to be able to predict um, and, and adequately set aside money for, for these uncertain future events. Um, so that's my intro. Hopefully that um, just wowed you into wanting to be an actuary. Um, <laughs> So a little bit about the life insurance industry in the United States. Um, so despite all of the, you know, what we discussed before about um, folks not wanting to discuss life insurance, 60% of people in the U.S. were in fact covered by some type of life insurance. This is as of 2018. Um, this data comes from a, a website, um, iii.org, so it has statistics on the life insurance industry. Um, and life insurance consumption. So the, I guess in the US, we spend on life insurance alone in 2019, um, in the US, $145 billion was spent on life insurance premiums, um, $680 billion of, of life health and annuity premiums. Um, it, it's interesting to note here that most life insurance companies actually um, generate more revenue from annuities than from life insurance. Um, and so you'll hear kind of the two terms like life insurance, you'll hear, hear them tied together quite a bit. Um, I think I'm looking at, I think we 
uh, when we kind of introduced ourselves last time, the actuaries that work at AIG, a, a few of us worked on life insurance specifically, and a few of us worked on annuities specifically. Um, and, and some of the work that we do in a lot of cases um, applies to both life insurance and annuities. Um, I put on here also just the top 10 writers of life, life insurance and annuities by premiums written in 2019. Um, so MetLife, close to 100 million of, or I'm sorry, 100 billion of premium written. Um, and this is life and annuities. Um, you see AIG falls in, in about number eight as of 2019. Uh, with about 25 billion um, of life and annuity premiums. Um, so just a little bit more about AIG. Um, so even at AIG, the, our life insurance, our life and retirement division is a, is a portion of, of the business that we do. We are a property casualty and life insurance company, but we're kind of split into two um, divisions. And so our general insurance arm um, really focuses more on um, insurance for basically property casualty type insurance. Um, so you can see here it says leading global provider of insurance products and services for commercial and personal customers but this is primarily in the property and casualty space. Um, and that is around the world. Our life and retirement division, which um, all of the actuaries on this call are part of our life and retirement division, um, which is our, our company that focuses, the branch of the company that focuses specifically on life insurance and retirement products, including annuities. Um, there's small amount of health insurance um, individual health insurance um, and some other um, products in there as well. Um, but just kind of to give you an idea of relative size of the life insurance piece of our of our business. Um, so 10% of, of all of the revenue that AIG generated comes from life insurance and that's this small sliver here. The purple section here is, is all of life and retirement. So the everything outside of this this one little block here is going to be um, generally annuity type products. Um, and so this 4.3 billion um, is, is the portion of our revenue that comes from life insurance. Um, so that's, um, that's a little bit about AIG um, and the life insurance industry. Um, I will, I guess, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the types of some of the broad product categories that, that our life insurance division um, sells and, and, um, and the, the products that the folks on this call work on. Uh, but I wanted to just level set with some definitions. I know when we talked before, there were people at kind of different levels of exposure to insurance and the insurance industry. So just a few um, terms that we'll use uh, that I'll talk about in the next few slides and possibly during Doug's um, section will also be discussed. Um, so premium, um, just very basic, is the amount of money paid from, from the insured to the insurance company in exchange for the, the insurance policy or coverage. Um, the benefit is the amount of money paid from the company to the insured when the insured event occurs. And so in the case of life insurance, the insured event is death. Um, if it were property or like auto insurance, for example, the insured event would be a car accident or you know that kind of thing. So I guess that that's kind of the thing that distinguishes the various types of um, you know insurance products, right? So life insurance, the insured event is death. Um, reserve um, is the amount of money that we set aside for our future um, benefits and claims, and so. At, at any given time, there's, um, you know, there are people dying and making life insurance claims, but but the insurance company has to set aside money for um, claims that will happen in the future um, at some, you know, some probability. And so that's 
a lot of the work that actuaries are involved in is, is the ter- determination of reserves and how much money we need to set aside for future claims. Um, valuation. So we use the term valuation. Um, actuarial valuation, I would say, is the calculation of reserves. You, you'll hear actuaries throw around the term valuation a lot, and it, it talks about it. I guess the, the meaning of that is the the calculation of the reserves that we'll need to set aside for our future claims. So um, you'll see, and I think in Doug's material that he sent around, there's a valuation date. So that that's kind of the, so every quarter we, or every month or um, at any given time, we'll define a valuation date. And that's the date that we're taking this snapshot or calculating the values of these policies or our future claims. Um, Life insurance policy, so that's that's the actual contract between the insured and the the insurance company. Um, And so it's it's basically just a contract, but we use the term policy. Um, Policy issue date is the starting date, um, the the date that that um, insurance policy starts, usually um, when the first premium is received, um, but there's like slight variations around that. Um, And life insurance product. Um, you'll hear, ex- or I guess folks in the insurance industry talk about a life insurance product. Um, and so I, I put here the definition as a, a, a company's variation on, on its offering of insurance coverage. Um, but basically, so when, a, when a, an insurer sets out to sell um, insurance to, to folks in the United States, um, you have to get like all of the pricing of of your product and your your rate making and all of that approved by the insurance regulator. Um, And so those those approvals are kind of submitted as packages um, and they're called an insurance product. Um, And so, you know, I guess different companies have different ways that they define what they call products. Um, But generally it's it's a set of rates and charges and features that are associated with um, with a typical insurance that's filed with with a with a regulator um, so I guess that I put that on there just because it's kind of a concept that you use the, the term product and it's not always super clear what a product means in the context of, of life insurance um, so I think we'll talk a bit more about that later um, any questions on any of any of the terms here? All right, moving along. Um, so a few kind of the broad categories of, of life insurance. So term life insurance. So term life insurance is is probably the least expensive type of insurance co- coverage available. The least expensive broad category. You're purchasing um, coverage for a certain period of time, um, a specified period of time that can be 5, 10, 15, 20 year term. There are all kinds of um, companies have all kinds of variations on the term length of the term product that they that they sell. Uh, but for term insurance, the premiums are, are a fixed amount um, and they're usually, a, you know, compared to other insurance type products, they're lower premiums. And they're paid annually, semi-annually, in, in different modes, quarterly or monthly, in a lot of cases. Um, and it just kind of depends on the what a company has available um, and what what option you choose. Uh, the death benefit on term insurance is a fixed amount, and it, it it basically says if you die anytime between the policy issue date and the end of the term period, um, then you'll get paid out this benefit that's specified if it's you know ten thousand dollars or a million dollars um that you've chosen um that's the the amount stays fixed for the term of of your policy um sometimes term insurance products have various riders available um and so these are kind of additional benefits that you would get along with your just fixed death benefit coverage um so an example of that would be um if, if we have riders that, that are called terminal illness riders, and so if you um, are diagnosed with a with a terminal il- illness, 
you're allowed to accelerate your death benefit um, and get the death benefit prior to um, death um, to use for, um, you know, any final expenses or other types of things that you might need if you're diagnosed with a terminal illness. Um, so that's term insurance. So next, whole life um, insurance. Um, so whole life insurance, basically the difference between that and term life is that the term of the coverage is the entire life of the insured. And so it doesn't end after five or 10 years. It continues on. The premiums are slightly higher for whole life, obviously because you're paying for a longer period of, of coverage. Um, let's see, what other differences? Uh, so, so whole life policies often, or I guess typically build a cash value. Um, and so for a whole life policy, if it, an insured elects to surrender their policy or end their policy after a certain, a certain amount of years, um, and they have a cash value, um, you would get that cash value back in exchange for, um, for ending your policy. So some amount less than the death benefit, um, but you know, you'd be able to recoup some of the cost that you paid into the policy with the whole life type coverage. Um, universal life insurance. Um, finally, I guess this is kind of the most flexible type of coverage. Um, the insured elects the amount of premium that they, they want to pay on any given date, uh, but the policy coverage staying in force just depends on you, your uh, account value. So you have a, an account that accumulates, um, and as long as that amount in your account is positive, then, um, then your, your coverage stays in force. And so um, it kind of combines the cash value feature that you had on whole life, uh, but you can build you know, more or less cash value depending on the amount of premiums that you pay. Um, and then you have the flexibility to pay more or less premiums as long as you pay enough to keep your policy, um, keep your uh, account value greater than zero. Um, the other thing about another feature of universal life insurance policies is that often you can increase or decrease your um, your face amount. Um, you can decrease the face if you just you know at, at a later date decide you don't need as much death benefit coverage. Um, as long as it's not decreased below an amount that would exceed um, a, a government government defined limit. Similarly, you can increase your face amount as long as you are able to, often if, if you increase your face amount, you have to go through the underwriting process again to ensure that you don't have any new you know, illnesses or anything that would make you more likely to have a claim. Um, and this is kind of to prevent people from, you know, so, so say I'm a policy owner that has a $500,000 policy, I find out I have cancer um, and then I go out and say I want to increase my my coverage to ten million dollars, you know, knowing that I'm likely to die in the next couple of years. Um, so, um, so you would have to get underwritten again to ensure that you're, um, you know, that we can provide the coverage. Um, so those are the three kind of broad major categories of um, of life insurance, and those are the three broad categories of, of insurance that that AIG sells and a lot of the folks um, on this call work with. Um, and, and AIG has lots and lots of variations of these um, types of coverages um, that we sell and price and value at any given date. Um, so I guess how, how does that end up in our financials? How does that impact us? Um, and how do we ultimately make money um, at an insurance company. So I, this this is um, a snapshot um, of our um, 20, I think this is from our 2019 um, annual statement. So this is our income statement. Uh, it shows the amount in millions um, from 2017 through 2019 um, that we took in. So the revenues are the top section, benefits and expenses are on the bottom section. So our revenues are the premiums that we take in, our policy fees, various fees that we charge to policyholders, um, depending on the type of insurance, the fees could be more or less. 
Um, we have investment income from the premiums and reserves um, that we've set aside in our investments. Um, and then other income, there's a bunch of miscellaneous things that fit into, into this category here. I called out in the benefits and expenses section a couple of items that require um, the, the most actuarial input, and these are the, the items that kind of actuaries probably spend most of their time on um, at, at an insurance company. So policyholder benefits and losses incurred. Wrapped up in this benefits and losses incurred is um, the amount like the change in our reserves for any given period. So, um, so if we're, you know, we may have held a certain amount of reserves in the last year. Um, so our actuaries would have calculated or valued our policies as of the end of 2018. Um, and we would have held a certain amount of reserve. Um, and then at the end of 2019, we recalculate that reserve amount. Um, and the difference, that increase in reserve also falls into this policyholder benefits and losses line um, because that's money that we set aside again for, for future losses. So this is not just claims that we paid in, in 2019. This is also uh, the increase in our reserves for future benefits. Um, the other item that, that kind of has a lot of actuarial input is this amortization of deferred policy acquisition costs. Um, so when you when you sell a life insurance policy, um, most of the expense associated with life insurance um, is on the sale of that policy. And so our commissions that we pay to our agents that sell our policies, um, our, the U.S. accounting rules allow us to defer some of that cost, that expense that we incur at the initial, at the onset of the policy. Um, I guess it, if you think about it, so the, the policy is for, say you have a 10-year term policy, the contract actually lasts, lasts for 10 years, but most of the expense that you're incurring is in that very first year um, that you pay out to your um, insurance agents for their first year commission. Um, and so it just would cause a, an unreasonable kind of earnings pattern if we, you know, recognize all of those expenses in that first year. So we'd have, you know, probably losses in that first year. And then the following years, um, as we take in more premium revenue, um, but don't have that same expense, um, we would have gains. And so our accounting rules, um, the, the U.S. accounting rules allow us to defer some of that expense um, and that calculation, the, the calculation of the amount that we can defer is an actuarial calculation. Um, and so those two are the two items on this um, income statement that kind of require the most actuarial input. I would say that the other items on the income statement, certainly they're, they're probably folks that have actuaries that have some, um, you know, some input into some of these items. Um, maybe indirectly, but, but the two kind of primary focuses of actuarial um, work and input are on reserves and deferred acquisition costs. And so these two lines here. Um, so that's, that's just a, a little bit about the types of things that we work on and how we contribute to the to the financials of the company. Um, I listed here just a few other questions that actuaries at an insurance company are charged with, with answering. Um, and I don't know, I guess if other folks, other AIG folks on the line wanna add other things, feel free. But um, so premiums, what, what premiums to charge for our policies? Um, and what, what should we charge for a UL versus a VUL, variable UL policy, for example? So a variable UL policy is a policy that has an investment component attached to it. Um, and so we would be um, involved in determining the prices for these, for these policies. Um, and so into that goes a lot of um, analysis of our, um, of our underwriting results, um, death claims and in, in the past um, our experience analysis means like our study of our prior um, death claims, as well as kind of the some of some, just a lot of other factors that would go into the differences between UL and BUL. Um, 
how much of the premium should we set aside for benefits, reserves, and expenses? And this is the piece that I talked about with valuation and reserving. Um, so determining how much of our premium that we take in needs to be set aside for future claims. Um, if a catastrophe ha happens, um, if, if so, for example, the COVID um, pandemic that we're in, what will our financials look like? So um, I've, I've been involved in some discussion threads and some work on um, trying to determine what our financials might look like over the next, I don't know, two or three years, depending on how persistent the COVID pandemic is or, you know, and so we do various studies on that type of thing. Um, sol solvency type thing. So what, what would it take for the company to go completely under? Like what, how drastic would the, would the, um, would the, our um, claims experience and the financial markets need to be for the com company to go completely under? Um, and then, um, so how good or bad were our assumptions? How accurate was our underwriting? Um, so we do a lot of kind of back checking to determine um, or, or to try to identify how well we've done with our underwriting or how poorly we've done if we were, you know, did a good job or a bad job of predicting how many death claims we might have in any given period. Um, so that's a few questions that I that came to mind for me. Um, and I guess if there aren't other questions from the other AIG folks. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Doug. I guess the, the last question on this list kind of is a is a segue into Doug and his work um, and how how that um, his work kind of plays into the work that um, that that Doug does and and at AIG. So Doug, do you um, I, I I put the case study problem on the last slide here, but um, I don't know if you have other materials. Yeah, it's not case study just yet. I okay, wanna, cool. I got a couple of things I want to talk about, and unfortunately, right, I'm not cool. as prepared as Brandon. I don't have a bunch of nice slides presented, so I'll have to sort of talk off the cuff. I hope you don't mind. Um, so a couple of things sure. off the bat. Uh, I guess I kind of introduced myself, but, um, you know, I don't kind of sort of a quiet quite a group so but you know I don't know what the the zoom etiquette is at University of Houston but you feel free to you know jump in interrupt me yell at me tell me I'm wrong whatever uh, I'd rather you do that than have a you know than, than than not hear anything from you it's hard enough for me to remember what I ate for lunch yesterday much less what a what a college student wants to know about actuarial science so you know uh, I'm, I'm I'm old so please tell me where I'm not helping um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, I kind of introduced myself at the beginning, but I'll, I'll go a little bit more into, into depth just to kind of give you kind of my background and, and hopefully it'll be helpful um, for you guys to kind of understand sort of the potential career trajectory of an actuary. Um, so I've been an actuary now for a long time, like uh, 18 years. Um, <clears throat> I uh, started actually at internships when I was in college. Actually, before I start, and I'll, maybe this will get some participation. How how are you guys freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors? Currently a junior. Term? Mostly juniors. Any, anybody? Yeah, I'm kind of mine's complicated, but I have two more years. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's fair. Two more years. Anyone else? Is that typical? Okay, I'll, I'll just assume that's typical. Okay, all right, well, um, yeah, so so good. All right, so, you know, so I had, you know, around, I guess, you know, the middle of my college career, I ended up starting to have internships. I did a couple internships in life insurance um, back where I grew up in Missouri. And, um, you know, that was interesting. I ended up graduating and went to uh, a health insurance company called Aetna. You may or may not have heard of it. It's a pretty big one um, in Hartford, Connecticut. Did there, I did uh, pricing work. So basically that is like deciding how much a person pays for health insurance, right? So you guys are pretty young, so you may not have had the, the fun experience of trying to decide what health insurance plan to get on, but at some point you will. And, you know, the, the amount you pay and the amount your employer pays um, is all developed basically by actuaries. 
Um, and I did that for a time for, you know, small groups with small companies, you know, two to 50 employees. Um, that was not my preferred thing to do. I did not love it. I mean, I, I, it was interesting enough, but I enjoyed life insurance more. So I kind of did a weird thing and switched back to life insurance after doing health um, for a while. Um, I thought life insurance is just a little more intellectually interesting to me, but I'm a, you know, I'm a weirdo. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. But, um, you know, so I switched back to life insurance, came down to AIG here in Texas, um, did term pricing for uh, uh, many years, like four or five years. Term pricing, again, is, you know, term, term insurance is what Brandon described it as. Pricing just means setting the rate so that, so that a person, you know, comes in, they're 30 years old, they're, you know, female and, and in good, sh good health. What's the premium we're going to charge them? Well, how much are they going to have to pay? to get the coverage they want, right? So there's actuaries deeply involved in that. And I would actually go a little bit further just to sort of build off what Brandon said that, I mean, actually, you know, most of the sort of traditional actuarial roles are, you know, valuation. And then I would say additionally, you know, sort of pricing, setting the rates for what people pay. Um, but I mean, you know, in a lot of companies, um, it goes pretty high up. So, you know, while I've been at AIG, there's been an actuary as a CEO, you know, probably about half the time. Um, so like, it's, it's a great career opportunity. I think, you know, Brandon's mentioned that in, in previous, in the previous version uh, or the previous uh, session, but, you know, you know, and I don't think our company is that unique. I think that, you know, that, that happens pretty often at life insurance companies. So it's a, there's sort of a, a very high ceiling, let's say for what actuaries can do with, at life insurance companies. Um, but anyway, um, back to, you know, where we're at. So, you know, I did a lot of, I worked for the CFO for a while doing financial projections. And then in the last five years or so, I've been doing a lot more data science type work, predictive analytics. Um, so, <clears throat> um, you know, the, initially that started out with actuarial assumptions. So like we built pricing mortality tables, which is sort of trying to predict, you know, how often or how frequently people are going to pass away. Um, depending on you know various characteristics, we then also um, <clears throat> uh, relatively shortly thereafter I moved into what I do now today still, which is predominantly um, automating um, our underwriting practices. So are people at all familiar with underwriting? Probably not, I guess. Um, underwriting means uh, you know so let's say you know a person comes in they want life insurance, right? So you know, as you're, I'm sure, aware, various people with different characteristics have different, you know, um, health characteristics, right, that, that would determine sort of whether they're a good mortality risk or a bad mortality risk. So underwriting is a process of sifting through information about that applicant in order to, to decide if they are a good or a bad risk, right? If they're a good risk, would they pay a lower price? And, you know, and they're, you know, they're healthier. So we think they're going to pass away to lower rate so they can pay a lower price. If they're less healthy, we want to give them a higher rate because we think that's more appropriate to the risk that they are, right? For the last hundred or so years, that's been done by people, you know, where if somebody comes in, you know, you know, mother of two comes in age 35, wants, you know, coverage. We get, a, we collect a bunch of information about them. You know, maybe we collect, you know, you know, their cholesterol, their, you know, their blood pressure. And we say, hey, you know, does this look like a good person or a bad person? That's been done by people. And now, you know, in the sort of new era of, you know, predictive analytics and data science, we are trying our best to, you know, automate that through um, using algorithms instead of people. Now, people still have a very large place in it, but, um, but it is, you know, sort of a, a, we're on a trajectory towards more and more automation of that. And that's, that's what I do um, day to day. Before I move on, any questions on that? Um, I, I would have a few questions, but I don't know how much time you have, maybe like five minutes or so, or sure. I can save it for the end. I, I think we have plenty of time for questions. Oh. I, yeah, I think, right. We have I think we can take like another two yeah. hours. Yeah. Okay. I, I also thought of one of these when Brandon was talking. So um, I, I used to work in uh, clinical trials for cardiology the last five years. And I, I want to mention medical data because 
even as someone that was working in it, unless I was like directly a physician or, you know, they got to log into the computer for me, even I had a hard time getting data for trials that I was doing uh, and needed it for. And basically what these companies, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, all them were doing these trials for is essentially the transaction was then buying medical data about their devices. So how do y'all get the data uh, for these devices and how accurate is it? Um, and how does that affect your job? That's, that's my first question. That's a great question. So um, we have a, a lot of third party vendors that aggregate and package data and sell it to us and other competitors in the industry, right? So probably the most common and most useful database that we get is uh, prescription histories, right? So you come in and apply, one of the things that you're gonna do if you, if you apply for life insurance is you're going to sign a, a HIPAA waiver, which is basically like a, basically it's, it, it authorizes that we can access your health information. And so we're gonna go out and we're gonna to try to access your prescription histories. You know, people your age are probably gonna have nothing on there. I mean, that, you're, you're all healthy and not really, you know, I'm, I'm guessing um, going to the doctor very often, but you know, people, you know, 60 or my age, you know, old, old people, <laughs> we have, uh, you know, we have prescriptions, unfortunately, and sometimes they're very serious, right? And so we can use those to, you know, to determine, okay, if they've got, you know, metformin, which you guys don't know what that is, but that's a diabetes drug, diabetes is a serious condition, so we would be more concerned about that person than someone who didn't have that. Um, let me think. Uh, to, your, to your question, if you're talking about, you, I think you're talking specifically about electronic health records which are definitely still uh, a new sort of frontier um, that is a challenge. They are a challenge to get. And we have, there's basically a number of companies in the space trying to sort of um, get them and get them well, right? Like the, the challenge is not that can someone get some of them, it's that nobody can get all of them and nobody can get them consistently. So that's, you know, like there's, probably 50 different companies that can get, you know, 2% of the market, but that, you know, that, that may, means you're getting the whole market, but nobody wants to work with 50 different companies. Um, you know, so, so that's the real challenge right now. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it did. Great. Uh, great question. Yeah. I, I didn't know what Matt Foreman was. That, that was one benefit of my job. Uh, okay. Another thing was a lot of these trials we worked in, uh, they had to have a control group to like establish that their device actually did cause the person to get better or to get worse or anything like that? Are, are causes important for your predictive models or is it just the end result? So it's yes and no. So, I mean, we are trying to predict all cause mortality, right? Like most of our products, it doesn't really matter why you pass away. If you pass away, we're gonna pay, right? Um, so if you, you know, if you have, you know, really terrible cancer, but then you die in a car accident, we're still going to pay for that, right? So it does. So from some standpoint, it doesn't really matter what the cause is. But, you know, as we get more sophisticated, you could certainly imagine a scenario where we say we're going to have one model for cancer risk and another model for motor vehicle risk. And those two are somehow going to interact and play together so that you get, um, you know, sort of a, a more sophisticated view. Right now, it's just sort of one big aggregated model. All right, all right, cool. I got my last question then, and this is more directed towards Brandon. Um, so as far as life insurance goes, uh, a lot of what you were talking about seemed kind of analogous to investing, where, you know, the, the in a nutshell thing I would tell to someone that knows nothing about investing is that you give the bank your money, they use your money to generate more revenue that you can't use to do the same thing, and then they give some of that back to you and then they take some of it. Um, obviously with health insurance, it seems a little bit of a different gamble because you're not always going to get seriously ill or injured, but you're always going to get a return from life insurance, presumably. Um, so, so how is that a good analogy to think about or is that totally different and I'm crazy? No, I mean, I, I think it's a, a good analogy. Um, I mean, so we're the, we are, AIG is a for-profit business, right? And so how do we make profit? A, a very large portion of that is from, from the income that we make on, from investing premiums and the returns that we get on the assets that we're able to invest in because we've, um, we've taken the premium. Now, the, and I, but I guess the, the benefit for the insurer is, so we are able to pool a bunch of 
um, you know, insurance together, I mean, obviously, and, and, you know, pay out a claim in that, you know, unlike, you know, in that circumstance of, of your death, you know, and I guess the bet that we're making or that, uh, you know, I guess that there is a bet being made, right? Like, so the insured is betting that they, you know, will, will pass away and, you know, make a claim before, um, you know, I guess it, before the, the value of the money that they've paid to the insurance company uh, that they've invested um, is, you know, has accumulated to the amount of the death claim. Um, and, and the insurance company is betting that with all of the millions and millions of insurance that we have, that we will, you know, have fewer claims than the amount of money that we've, um, that we've accumulated at any given time for those claims. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good analogy. Um, it's, um, you know, I guess that's kind of the, the at the heart of the, the industry, right? Why it's a profitable business for us and it provides a, a service, which is the protection for the, for the insured. Um, does that, answers the question at all or yeah yeah it does perfect yeah. uh, thank you all very much yeah one thing i'll just add is that it's sort of a hedge right sort of a longevity hedge because i mean if you think about right you buy you know a lot of people say and and i think it's a legitimate viewpoint is that well what if you save your life insurance premium you just invest it and that you know like if and if you live a long time, that's probably, and, and you know, I hope everyone does, right? But if you, if that happens, then you probably win out in the end, right? But if you've got, you know, but unfortunately, right, it does happen that you, you know, that people, you know, unfortunately pass away earlier in life, right? And, you know, if you have significant, you know, outstanding liabilities, whether it be, you know, maybe you have a mortgage, you have got a, a spouse with, a, you know, you've got, you know, or you've got, you know, God forbid, you know, little children, right? Like then you, you might not, you know, you might want to have that coverage in case you, you know, like, you know, cause you won't have saved enough in the first couple of years to, to offset, you know, what you could theoretically get from a small life insurance premium. Great questions. Any other questions right now? take that as a oh. um I have one could you just um I guess like my perception of underwriting I don't know if um I have it exactly right is like the application of data that like an actuary would gather is that correct or like is underwriting done by actuaries as well well so that's a funny thing so most of the time underwriting is done by underwriters but with sort of the um you know, across the industry, we are seeing sort of both, two things happen. One is new types of underwriting methods are, are being created, right? So um, I didn't touch, I didn't touch on this too much at the beginning, but, you know, one of the things when you, to dip it, in a traditional application for under, for life insurance, you would get, um, what, someone would come to your house and they would draw labs, right? So they'd actually take your blood and take your urine. And that's extremely valuable information because we can look at your cholesterol. We can look at, you know, they'll also weigh you and they'll me you know, measure your blood pressure. Those are all very useful things for us to use to determine your sort of long-term health outlook, right? That's not, as you can imagine, I'm sure you're sitting there saying, that doesn't sound very fun. Well, most people don't think it's very fun, right? And so one of the things we're doing in the industry is trying to move away from that type of underwriting where we basically instead, you know, someone applies, instead of sending someone out, you know, kind of coming to their home and sort of awkward, you know, you do, you know, you know, drawing blood, which no one wants to do, right? Like, so, so instead of doing that, we would, um, you know, just use the third party information we have available to say, we think, you know, we think like, like the prescription database, we think that this person is generally healthy because, you know, the only prescriptions they have are for, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I, and anxiety, right? Like lots of people take anxiety medication. That's no big deal. Um, <clears throat> you know, and so we are moving in that direction. That is a sort of non-traditional underwriting technique. And what we're seeing in that transition is that it's less done by underwriters and more done by, you know, people with more of a data background, right? So actuaries are certainly a big part of that. They understand the risk. Data scientists are also playing a role. Um, there's sort of a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's sort of a hodgepodge right now. Um, but 
you know, traditionally underwriters have done underwriting <laughs> and that's a whole career path of itself. But as we move forward and the, the value and importance of data become, increases, you know, we see that, you know, at least in our company and I think in most companies, we're seeing that, you know, uh, pe- you know, professions that can use that data are sort of becoming more prominent and sort of, you know, yeah, becoming more prominent. And I mean, that's actually where, actually, you know, I'm sorry, I'll keep going, but I, I you know, you, you tell me to stop if I need to stop. But, um, you know, but one of the things that you'll see is that like, well, now I've forgotten what I was going to say, so I guess I'll stop. Um, <laughs> yeah, if, if you need any evidence that I'm old, here it is. I, I just completely forgot what I was going to say. So, um, <laughs> but uh, maybe it'll come back to me when someone asks another question. Um, I did have hey, a Doug, question and... about the, uh, when you're talking about prescription information. Yeah. I mean, I assume you have to couple that with some other information about whether or not the person is active, like actually goes to a doctor, right? Because I mean, one thing lack of prescriptions could indicate is yep. lack of actual paying attention or, you know, at least ability to pay attention to their healthcare in a, in a real way or in a kind of modern way of, you know, being on top of these things. Yep. Uh, and there being a large number of people in our society who either you know can't afford or just neglect outright, uh, those would seem to indicate higher yes. death levels, right? I mean, un- undiagnosed illnesses are probably, I would assume, a, a, a significant uh, factor. Yes, um, you're absolutely right. So a, a, a clean prescription history could mean one of two things. It could mean that they're going to the doctor regularly and they are in tip top shape, or it could mean that they are not going to the doctor and you know may- maybe they're still in tip top shape or they're not going to the doctor because they don't want to find out how bad things really are, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that's always a, a risk, definitely. Um, you know, y- y- the way I would say it is that very commonly people who are in pretty poor shape end up getting to a doctor, you know, you know, once it gets serious, they tend to find a way to a doctor, right? You know, and, and that's when we typically would catch them. Now, if they, you know, but, but you, you know, there's definitely sort of avenues by which someone could be, you know, not maintaining their health, you know, and then, you know, and, and we would not know about some of the leading indicators of poor health down the line because they aren't, make, they aren't doing the things they should be doing preventatively. And then, you know, find out after we've issued the policy. And that, that happens. That, I mean, so under, I mean, underwriting is very much a game of, you know, trying to anticipate, you know, we want to sell insurance to people who have a legitimate reason for it, but we aren't, we can't be in the business of, you know, oh, I just found out I have liver cancer, I'm gonna go buy life insurance. We, that's not a sustainable business for us to be in, right? Because, you know, Life insurance is highly leveraged, right? You might pay $1,000 for a premium, but you might get a million dollar death benefit, right? So if everybody that had liver cancer went and paid $1,000 and we paid them a million bucks, we wouldn't last very long. Um, so we have to, you know, so we have to be very careful that people are buying it for legitimate reasons. You know, bad things happen and that's fine. We're going to pay that happily. But, you know, people that are sort of, we do see, unfortunately, people that will attempt to, uh, strategically forget uh, the conditions that they have uh, when they apply for life insurance. I saw there's a, there's a comment in the chat that oh. um, mentions if Yeah. So if, I think Travis, you said if someone has health insurance, that um, the, at least the health insurance company would know how often they're going to a doctor. So um, I don't know, Doug, do you know if we use any, any like data from, from like health insurers or anything like that? Yeah, we do actually. So that's one of the ways that we're getting electronic health records in sort of a more digestible format. So, you know, we, we will partner with, really we partner with third party data providers, but they partner with health insurance companies to get, you know, claims, you know, so if you go to the doctor to get, you know, if you go to the hospital to get your, you know, a lung transplant, right, you know, then, then, 
that may not necessarily show up as a medication you're taking, but it will certainly show up as a hospital bill. And so we, we would see that too, potentially. That's a little bit newer and we're still trying to figure out how to like ingest that exactly. Um, it's not as established as prescription history, but it's something we do, yeah. Right, because that, that was actually what I was thinking um, uh, from the standpoint of aligning our risk uh, to, you know, um, to their, their, uh, their health history. Yep. So the, the tying in of uh, working with our health partners, you know, I, I would be like, that would probably help us in that underwriting automation uh, that's, yep. that your team work on, works on. Yep, great deal. I mean, one of the, you know, so, so there's, there's a, it's a great opportunity and a significant challenge, right? Because you've got, mm -hmm. you know, so you get, you know, a person's health history, right? I mean, you guys are probably not familiar with the term, but it's called ICD-10 codes. It's how doctors code up, you know, um, conditions that they, that they diagnose in their patients, right? There's something like 40 or 50,000 of them, right? And so, you know, you get a, you get a health record from, you know, from a, from a, from a data vendor, they may not, um, you know, they might just send the codes, right? And so we have to know what to do with those codes, right? And so we have to know how to act on 40 or 50,000 codes. That's a challenge. And that's where, you know, I mean, that's frankly where, you know, actuaries and, you know, and data scientists really get to, you know, to, to play because that's, you know, it's basically impossible to write rules, you know, sort of that humans can follow for 50,000 different unique conditions. Whereas, you know, a computer, if you give it the, you know, if you give it the parameters to work with, can do that, right? And that's not that hard. Great questions, guys. Great questions. Any others? I actually just thought of one more. Um, Great. So uh, another thing that we did at my clinic is if someone had a low ejection fraction in their left ventricle, which we measured from an echocardiogram, uh, they would be indicated for, you know, congestive heart failure or sudden cardiac death, stuff like that, and they would get a Bybee pacer. Um, but not all of them do. So obviously, if someone gets an ICD-10 code that we see that they got a Bybee pacer, like, you know, they're probably getting held together by stitches a bit, or there's a lot of reason to worry. I mean, I, I see uh, Bybee pacers are like this big. They're Nokia phones, basically, in your chest. Um, but if you get an ICD code that came from an echo, and their EF is like 50 or 55 and they don't get it, um, is that data you can use or do you have to actually know the results of these diagnostics or um, would, you, would you be able to work just as well with just the billing codes? So that's an interesting question. So if it's diagnosed, then we can use it. If it is, if it's suspected, I don't believe we can use it. Right, and there's a pretty big difference. There's an important distinction there, right? So if, you know, like, I, I don't know exactly how we would get it, but I know that that's the case. So we have, so we have to, you know, so even on our application, when we say, hey, have you ever had HIV? We can't just say, have you ever been suspect suspected of having HIV? We have to say, have you been diagnosed with it, right? So even if someone, I guess, suspected they had, but had not ever gone to the doctor, we would need, you know, we would not be able to use that. Um, as far as like in the actual medical records, we haven't, you know, I'll be honest, you know, this is still pretty cutting edge stuff. So I don't know that I have a really strong answer on this, but um, we are, you know, like one of the advantages of going through the medical claims records, as we said, is that because there, there are claims that hospitals or doctors are sort of saying have, have happened is that we know that like it's already been adjudicated. It means that, that both the patient and the provider have agreed that that's what happened and that was the situation. So then we don't have any concerns around like, you know, was it a was it suspected of a certain condition or was it a, you know, did it actually happen? Does so, that make so, sense? So the situation I, I'm envisioning is, um, you know, someone comes into our clinic and they are winded getting up the stairs, they passed out while they were driving or something like that. And the doctor says, okay, go get an echo and we're gonna look at your EF and I'm gonna give you a prescription for amiodarone just for now. And this, this happens a lot actually, just so that we wouldn't have to have them come back into the clinic just to get a prescription because the results from the echo can fax back to our office and we have to maybe do a virtual clinic visit now that the pandemic happened, but we would give them a prescription and maybe if the echo result came back, 
they don't end up taking amiodarone, but now you have a prescription for amiodarone that you're not using. Um, and what if you compare that person that got an echo to uh, an equal healthy person that's the same age, same demographics. I mean, I imagine that the person that actually got sent for the echo would be at a higher risk, wouldn't they? Even if there's not a diagnosis. So, I mean, some of this getting a little bit in the weeds, but one of the things we found is that in general, right, like a, it's like a first approximation. If you want to know how risky a person is, you can count up the number of interactions they've had with the health system, right? I mean, like, you know, like it doesn't take a, you know, it doesn't take a, you know, if someone's got, you know, a hundred different health claims from last year, right? You, you can know without knowing much about what those health claims are, you can tell that compared to someone who had one or zero, chances are that person with a hundred is less healthy. Right. It just it just works out that way. Now, you know, some of that's intuition, you know, like it might be, you know, like with anything, there's it's an approximation and you and you sometimes get it wrong. Um, but the person that you're talking about that passes out on the way up the stairs, they're gonna be they're gonna be in the health system in more than just that way, right? Like they're gonna, you know, they're gonna we're gonna be able to find, you know, people who are very, very unhealthy are sometimes actually easier to find just because there's so many ways that they show that they're unhealthy. It's actually the people kind of in the gray that are actually harder, right? Where they, you know, maybe they have a couple of, of interactions with the health system, but they're, you know, but it's not clear if they're just, you know, being, you know, safe, being conservative, or if they're really, you know, starting to get sick. Right, that, that answers my question. I'll, I'll, st I'll stop now. No worries. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's fun. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll continue with my. My notes here. All right. Yeah. So I guess I, I did this. I'm going to, I'm going to, so I, I apologize. Some of this may be a little bit of a repeat from last time, but I did want to give my two cents and kind of like, you know, try to do something that's a little bit interesting, possibly to you guys, because, you know, like talking about what I do, you know, it's probably not the most interesting thing, but I want to talk about like, um, you know, kind of like what I would see, you know, I, I hire actuaries all the time, like, you know, like what would be some of the things I would recommend that you guys, you know, do where you are right now to sort of get ready um, for a career in actuarial, if that's what you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about kind of like skills that I would develop. Um, so I'll go from sort of like the most obvious to the least obvious. So the most obvious are like, you know, if you're going to be in actuarial science, you need to have some proficiency in math and statistics, right? Like you just, that's sort of table stakes. Um, you know, if you're, if you're coming in and, and math is your worst subject, then that's probably going to be a concern, right, for doing actuarial work. There's a certain amount of, and you'll get this in the exams if you've already taken some. If you haven't, you'll see it soon. But, <clears throat> um, you know, but there's a certain amount of proficiency you just need in math and statistics. Not exactly surprising. I'm sure you guys have already seen that. One thing I would highly, highly, highly recommend, and I don't know how much it's in the curriculum today, but to the extent that you get a chance to learn how to do some programming, you will find that that will help you for your entire career. Um, probably the most useful thing I have learned in college was how to program because immediately once you get out, you can start to use that. You know, chances are you're gonna start working for someone who's a lot older than you, like maybe as old even as I am, God forbid. And what you're gonna find is that, you know, um, they will not have the technical knowledge that you will have. And if you can, you know, <laughs> the first job I had when I was still an intern was I, I had to, you know, I was working for an older actuarial lady. She was extremely nice, but she had this manual process that she did and it took, she had got requests in and she had to go through a manual process to, um, you know, to basically find the information and send it back. And it was like a, she got several a week and it was like a couple hours each time, right? And I was able to, you know, because I had a little bit of programming knowledge, I was actually able to automate that. Um, and it turned what was a two hour process into a button click. Um, and she thought I just, I'd work magic. She thought I was Nostradamus, right? And like, so it, it's just, and, and there's, there's very few things that are as satisfying as that. And there's very few things that sort of like will propel your career forward as things like that, especially if you work for people who are less technical than you. Um, so I would highly recommend, uh, you know, doing some programming. What language isn't as important because just learning the basics of programming is super useful. Um, if you have a choice, Visual Basic for applications is the one that, you know, everyone uses Excel. So in every company that you go to, probably someone's using Excel. So if you learn that, because that's 
built into Excel. It's very, very helpful. That'll do 80 to 90% of anything you'd want to do. Um, if you want to get into more data science, data analytics type work, then I would recommend learning R or Python. Um, you know, I think, I think on the actuarial curriculum, R is sort of becoming a requirement anyway. So that's good. Um, you know, but I would highly recommend those things. It's, it's a, it's a great way to, I mean, you know, I didn't learn programming. I didn't use programming because I wanted to get ahead in my career. I mean, it helped me a lot in that, but you know, I, I did it because I was lazy, right? I, I started doing work and I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is, you know, it takes forever to do this thing. Why don't I learn how to automate it? And turns out that, you know, doing that is a, is a real, is a real benefit. So uh, I'd highly recommend that. And then, and then a weird one, actually, I'm going to mention, but, you know, once you get to a certain level in actuarial, in your actuarial career, um, you know, one thing that comes up actually more often than you would expect, I think, is ethics, actually. So I would actually recommend um, that you take a little bit of, you know, not, not a ton, right? I know there's a limited amount of time, but I would actually recommend that, you know, an, an ethics course or something like that would be quite interesting. I actually minored in philosophy. Um, and aside from it being a really nice sort of uh, uh, distraction from, you know, just math all day long was actually really interesting, but I think it's actually helped me a lot in my career. Um, there's, I could, you know, count quite a few situations where, you know, having some grounding in ethics and kind of like what is ethical behavior, um, you know, because there are problems that come up, right? And so any, any business is going to have some ethics you know, at situations of ethics. And as an actuary, you will frequently be in the room when those things are decided. And, you know, just having a little bit of grounding in that, I think could be quite valuable. All right, that's the end of my introductory notes before we get into the, the practice problem. Any other questions before we do? No, okay. All right, so then, I actually don't have to show my. You are. You want me to share? I, I think you're a host also, Doug, but I can share the problem if you want, whatever you prefer. Yeah, let me just, I just got to pop it open. I'm sorry, I didn't have it open. Okay. okay. So actually, now I have to learn how to share here. Okay. <laughs> and I'm slow. I apologize. Okay. All right, so before we get into the case study specifically, um, <clears throat> I just want to, so, so I think, you know, Brandon started to introduce it and we talked a little bit about underwriting already, but, you know, one of the things that we do when we're doing underwriting, right? I mean, like, you know, basically, you know, we are frequently, you know, especially nowadays, we are frequently sort of revising how we underwrite, right? So underwriting was pretty stable for 10, 20, 30 years when it was just, people doing it, um, you know, the, the requirements were generally the same, you, you know, you had the same level of information that has all gone out the window. And now, you know, constantly we are changing both what, what data we're getting, what we're using to make the decisions and things like that. And so there's a lot of question around, you know, we've made all these changes to our underwriting and now we're selling this product using that underwriting is, have we done the right thing or have we not? effectively right have we have we appropriately you know created the underwriting requirements so that you know we're going to get a reasonable level of claims or have we you know kind of you know made a big mistake right and so and that's actually something you know every quarter we get claims experience brandon was talking about it we look at it constantly because you know we do a lot of testing on the front end we do a lot of you know you know, validation work to see, to make sure we're doing the right job with our, with our algorithms. But at the end of the day, you know, rubber hits the road when you actually start seeing claims experience on these things, right? So we are constantly looking at our claims experience to make sure that there's not some big thing we've missed. There's not something like that. Um, and so this is a problem, you know, it's obviously kind of a made up problem, but it has real life implications, which is exactly what I just said, which is, you know, at some point you start getting claims experience on a product you wrote uh, on an underwriting regime that you put in place. And then you need to start to think, okay, did I, is this, was this a bad, did we do a bad job on this? And, you know, or did we do a good job on it? Um, and so this is sort of a, a, a problem in that, in that vein. 
Um, do I, should I read through it or should I give you guys a minute to read through it or how should we do this? Yeah, I'm sure everybody's probably seeing it for the first time, right? We just sent this out. Um, yeah, do you all want to take a couple minutes, read through it, and then we, if you have questions, get back with them. I guess this is where it's helpful to, I guess, once you're done reading, look up at the screen or if, if folks can type in the chat when they're done reading, if they have questions. I can't see everybody. Is everybody good? Looks like everybody's looking. Okay, so it, I, it, do you want a few more minutes or are we good to talk about it? So we have, so okay, I'll assume we're good. Um, so we have, I mean, so, so so, so this is a, you know, a, a, a generated problem here, right? So it's, you know, so, so what we've assumed here is that there's sort of two, there's two outcomes to our, you know, to the product, we developed a new product that has a new set of a new, new type of underwriting being used, right? And there's, a, we're saying effectively that there's, we know ahead of time that there's only two outcomes, right? It can either be healthy and good, that's the nice class, or it can be, you know, bad and terrible, and that's the whoopsie class, right? If it's a whoopsie class, then, you know, like practically what that would mean is if it's a nice class, we keep trying to sell it. If it's a whoopsie class, we'd want to get, we'd want to stop it, right? We'd want to say, hey, don't sell this product anymore. We screwed up, right? Now, in this case, we are assuming they're both equally likely. If, <laughs> if you had a job and you, and <laughs> you were as equally likely to make a mistake in, in selling a product as you were to not, you probably wouldn't have that job for very long, but obviously for this example, we're just going to say that they're equally likely. It could be either one, right? Um, and then let me share. And so the, the goal of this is then to say, okay, using conditional probabilities, uh, you know, we, we have the claims experience. Can we back into what is the chance that this is a whoopsie product? And what, what is the chance effectively that we made a mistake, right? Um, and then the experience is provided in an Excel worksheet, um, which I don't, I have, but I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah, I think it was in the chat. I think Mohammed shared it in the chat. Um, okay. Can yeah. you see it here? Is it small? Yeah. So, this is a, you know, obviously a very simplified version of kind of like a, the, the data you might see if you saw an experience report. So this has the valuation date. That's just sort of like the date we're evaluating what's happening. You have the issue date. That's just when the policy was issued. And you'll see there's only, well, I don't know how much I should tell you, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you that there's only two issue dates. There's January 1st or July 1st. So it's either, you know, so the exposure is how many years of experience you have, right? So we try to simplify it so you only have half a year or a full year. Um, and then you have whether or not it claimed or not, a one means it claimed, a zero means it didn't. And then if it did claim, how much did you pay? So it's either you didn't pay anything or you paid 10,000 bucks for a claim. I guess, Doug, I, I think I meant to put exposure in my um in my definitions above just so that everyone's clear and this is if everybody understands this apologies for repeating but so the exposure we use the word exposure to um so usually like a year is a is a period of exposure and so for the period basically this is saying that like on the first row for the period ending december 31st 2020 because the policy was issued 
midway through the year, you get half an exposure for that um, for that policy. I think that concept might come up on a later exam. So just want to make sure folks understand what the difference between like a, a half of an exposure is because you're only your policy is only active for half of the year, and so and then a full exposure if your policy was issued at the beginning of the year. Um, just to kind of equally weight, you know, how how much of the experience applies to each policy. That makes sense. Okay, so then are we, are we, I mean, how are we gonna, should we give people time to, to work through it or should we, how should we do this next part? Yeah, I guess maybe, um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing just because I'm so far removed from <laughs> from these problems. Um, just looking at the at the question that's stated, does anybody kind of have an idea of, of, of how to start the problem or of what concepts we might be using here just to get started. All right, yeah, that sounds like we might need to give like a <laughs> to give like a, a primer on the concepts and yeah, you know, you know. Yeah. So right. So this is effectively a, a like a, a, a Bayesian prior problem, uh, which means that you have two potential. Uh, so it's it's a binomial yes no problem, right? So either they claim or they don't, right? So that's and then you have you know ten thousand policies, seventy five hundred exposures. So you can calculate what is the likelihood of of the um, of each you have your experience, right? So you can calculate the likelihood function of each uh, of the experience given each potential outcome, right? So if it was a whoopsie class product, then what would the likelihood be of this kind of exposure? If it was the nice class product, what would the likelihood be of that kind of exposure or of that kind of experience, right? Um, so you can think of it as, as, as you know, 7,500 binomial trials. With 15, well, with 15 successes being the claims. Um, and then you can calculate the Bayesian prior probability. I'm so, I hope I'm saying this right. It's been a while since I've done this, but the Bayesian prior probability that um, it's, I think I said, what is the probability that it was a whoopsie class? So calculate the Bayesian prior probability of it being a whoopsie class. And then the second one, and this is a this is a little uh, this is a thing I've seen in actual exams, at least back you know when I took them. Um, is a lot of times the second question is actually easier than the first. I've noticed that the second one actually I think is somewhat easier than the first because it's you know it's just basically 80 80 percent benefit ratio is just saying you want your premium you want your benefits to be eighty percent of your total premium, right? So if you can calculate what you expect your benefits to be. And your premium is just, you know, the, the number that would make 80% of it the benefits. Does that make any sense at all? If I said nonsense. Yeah, I guess maybe to, to Greg and Mohammed. Um, I think I saw, have we covered Bayesian prior on the syllabus yet? Um, are those concepts, have y'all covered those yet? Thank you, I'm mute. Um, yeah, and the next uh, part, uh, I mean, the second half, I have covered like conditional probabilities. Oh. Yeah, which we use Bayes theorem and this kind of stuff, yeah. And Greg also in the first half has covered some stuff about that. Oh, so this might not be appropriate then. I'm sorry. I screwed up here. Uh, 
maybe yeah i guess maybe we can walk just walk through <laughs> walk through the solution then the, oh somebody okay. says we can somebody wants to give it a shot is that <laughs> Wow, yeah. I guess enterprise and young actual students want to give it a shot. <laughs> All right, let me see if I've got it here pulled up. Um, so okay, so this is that's gonna be ugly, but I'll show it. So um oops. Okay. I'm not sure how to still figuring out how to show this here. Uh, okay, well, actually, let me let me start with the sort of theoretical solution here. So, um, sorry, I should have had this prepared. Are you looking for the the, the yeah. formula that we were discussing earlier, Doug? Yeah. Okay, I just found it, I think. Okay. Okay, so this is the this is the equation you use here. So uh so <clears throat> B is your experience. AI is your, whether it is the class, right? So the probability of the whoopsie class given B your experience is the probability of your experience given the whoopsie class times the probability of the whoopsie class over the sum of the probability of sort of like the weighted average um, probability. So that's the, 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 but this is across all classes. So the probability of, of your experience given uh, the whoopsie class times the probability of the whoopsie class plus the probability of the experience given the nice class times the probability of the nice class. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, we've worked with them, that formula. Oh, okay. All right, great. Well, then maybe it wasn't such a huge screw up. That's I should have done like a base theorem. problem in math for this. this <laughs> What's the probability I did a whoopsie problem for this this exhibit? <laughs> I think yeah, I think uh, I think because we we know it as Be Bayesian prior. They, this Bayesian this Bayesian um, back we call it Bayes theorem. Yeah, Bayes theorem. What they're mm -hmm. with? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So you didn't you didn't make a whoopsie. <laughs> Yay! At least once. <laughs> Okay, well, that's how you solve it. So these are like, so the probability is likelihood function. Um, it probably, you probably might need Excel to do the likelihood function because some of the things like the combinatorics will not be very easy on like a calculator. I, I don't know. My calculator did not like it, but Excel would handle it. I can show you the solution here too. I don't know how to put this put away. Okay. So I so I, I did it hideously ugly, but um, hopefully you guys can sort of see what this is. So so the likelihood of the nice class is this. Uh, can you guys even see that? It's really small to me. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. So it's basically, you know, you have the probability of the claim, there's 15 claims. There's a the probability of no claim, you have 7,500 exposures, but, but you had 15 claims, so 7,500 minus 15. And then you have the number of possible combinations of that, so that's 7,500 choose 15. So you, know, you have 7,500 times it could have happened, and 15 actual claims, so that's your combinatorics. Um, this is a super tiny number, and this is a super big number, and together you get what rounds to zero. Um, and then that's for the nice class, so the nice class has a, oh, did I do this wrong? Oh, whoops, I did whoopsie first.
And then for the <clears throat> um, for the nice class, you have a much lower uh, probability. Um, you have 15 claims and uh, you, have, you know, so because you have a lower probability of claim, you have a higher probability of no claim. Again, you do the same, same exponent and then it's again, the same combinatorics. works. Oh, I think I did this wrong too. I did 0.05%, but it's 0.05. That's 0 0.005. Wow. That's embarrassing. But I did do a whoopsie on my own problem. But I actually, those were not the right. Those were not the right percentages because the problem was 0.05 percent. Yeah. So I I had not put the decimals in the right place. Wow. Does that make sense to anyone? What I did there. Yeah. So Doug, these are likelihoods that these are likelihood functions that you're in the whoopsie and nice class. And I guess should we should you expand if you expand out the like both of those are zero. You oh right, yeah, so they're super small. Um, so right. it's, it's it's not very useful to look at them by themselves. I mean, so the the probably the likelihood that it's in the whoopsie is much much higher, but the likelihood that it's in the nice. I mean, if you look at the actual claims distribution, it's what fifteen over seventy five hundred. So it's much, you know, if you do that as a percent, it's actually higher than the, the whoopsie class, right? So it's actually literally worse than your sort of worst case scenario right now, right? Now, obviously there's, you know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons why, it, you know, it, it could go back down to your worst case scenario. But the fact that it's already worse than your worst case scenario is a pretty high indication that it's gonna be a whoopsie, right? From the day, from the beginning, right? But you can then calculate that it is roughly a hundred percent chance, which means that you know you'd want to take this product, you know, to a screeching halt, right? You would want to immediately shut it down, right? I mean, that's that's the practical implication of it. Yeah. So, Doug, maybe um, I guess is it reasonable or easy for you to kind of link this to some of the um, work that you do um, on kind of looking at mortality experience and um, and kind of building our mortality models and refining our mortality models going forward um, yeah I mean so I mean so there's a couple of things we do with mortality, right? So I mean, so the one thing, you know, so, so the obvious thing we do is when we're building algorithmic underwriting regimes, we, we do two things. We try to attempt to match historical human underwriting outcomes, right? So for example, you know, if a human would have typically given this case uh, preferred plus like the best class, then we would want to make sure that the algorithm is trying to do that as well, right? That that's typically what's happening, right? The other thing that we do though, is we look at mortality outcomes, right? So it's generally the case that a good underwriting rating is going to lead to a good underwriting, uh, to good mortality outcomes, but it's not always the case. There are exceptions and, there, and there's exceptions in both directions. And so what we separately do when we're, we're building, you know, these sort of underwriting algorithms is that we, um, is that we, we match that to, we match their, the sort of outcomes to um, our existing mortality experience, right? So if we see that, you know, a 25 year old that has 15 DUIs has extremely high claim experience, which it probably does, 
um, then we would want to make sure that even if even if historically our underwriters have been giving them a pass for whatever reason, we would want to make sure that our algorithm is assessing that risk appropriately, right? And so we would look to the we would look to the mortality to sort of sort of guide us in that direction. Now the way we do that is not exactly by this. We use you know it's 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 actually not the not the different than this, but we use you know some you know we use you know effectively maximum likelihood estimation to sort of optimize for what is the likelihood of, of this person, you know, passing effectively. Um, that's one way. And then <clears throat> the other thing we do is sort of is, is more similar to this, right? Which is that we look at our claims experience historically and just see, you know, I won't, <laughs> I won't uh, out myself too much, but I will say that, you know, this this sort of case study and finding a whoopsie is uh, closer to my lived experience than I would like to admit. Um, you know, it does happen, right? You know, you do see things where it's you know it, it happens. Um, I don't know if I'm answering anyone's question there or not, but. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions on how this was solved or, or how it's even done? I'm not sure I, I adequately described it. Like what, uh, the, the likelihood of nice, that, that's, that's uh, calculating for what here? Uh, so we have 15 claims, so it's 0 0.0005 as to the 15th times you've got, you know, the likelihood of no claim, you know, for everybody else times the sort of, you know, combinatorics of 7,500 choose 15. I think you're leveraging the, the binomial uh, function right here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's that. Yeah. Yeah. I should have right. mentioned this is, this is the probability of this specific outcome happening of, yeah, you have 7,500 trials and 15 and 15 successes. When you have this probability of success, this is, mm -hmm. this is the likelihood of that happening. So that it would be like the likelihood of the outcome given, like we're setting that it's a, a whoops. Yep. Right. We're saying, we're saying, okay, let's assume that this is true, right? That this is yeah. the actual ability of a claim, then this is the likelihood that that would actually happen. And of course, because this claim rate is so high, it's the, the, the likelihood of it being an actually nice product is vanishingly small, right? Right. You know, and and, and I'll, I'll say this is actually like, it's sort of a silly result to say, well, it's 100% likely it's the whoopsie class, but this is actually kind of more what you see in, in I mean, <laughs> to some extent, you, you can find out sometimes pretty early that, you know, that something's gone awry, right? Like, you know, it, it, is, it is not always like, oh, it's a, you know, 50-50 shot. It's a lot of times you do see things that are pretty cut and dry that, you know, there's a problem here. I think there might, might be a decimal error there. Uh, Which one? Could be mistaken, but uh, like for, for the whoopsie class, it's 0.5% and for the nice class, it's 0.05%. 0.5, did I get it wrong again? My goodness. 0.5%, you are correct. So whoopsie would be- so, so I don't think it's gonna be it, just 100% that- uh. Uh-oh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Not so cut and dry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you'd still you'd still shut this product down. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, yes, it's not quite as cut and dry. But you'd still shut it down. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. And I think a good takeaway for the students also that you use the combine function in Excel. So when you want to do like I don't know, 7,500 7, choose fifteen, which is in the binomial function, you can use the combine, uh, combine. <laughs> yep. All right. Yep, that's a useful function. Although it, run, it, it, it hits size limitations even in Excel, I've found. Mm. Uh, especially if you start using large data sets. Like we're lucky that this isn't, we didn't make it too big, but 
it, you know, if you use very large data sets, you will run into, it will run into sort of overflow errors. Then, and then you probably need to use R, right? Which is, which is generally the case for almost everything. Excel is, Excel is good for modestly sized data sets, but once you get to big data sets, you really need to use R or Python, something that's designed for that type of, type of work. Um, so column D would be like the binomial, that's the formula you used. And then column E would be the, the bigger Bayes theorem, that would be the formula you put in. Uh, yes, right. Okay. So it's, this is actually the one that's correct. So this is the probability of whoopsie times the likelihood of whoopsie over the sum product is the, well, that's basically just summing the product. So it's D7 times D10 plus D10, D8 times D11. I mean, I, I could write it out. Maybe I should write it out so it's more obvious what I'm doing here. So that's what it's doing is it's taking the Other questions? Everybody good on the solution? Yes, it makes sense. Very good. So I, guess, I, I guess that's the end of your prepared remarks. Yes, it is. Oh, all right. So I think that's all we had. Um, I think we have time. I mean, we, we can certainly do more Q&A if folks have questions that we have a few other um, folks on the line from AIG as well. Cameron, Sean, Christina, Nick. Um, I'm looking, looking. I think Maggie may not be um, actively on, but she leads our student program. Um, but if there, uh, yeah, we welcome any other questions that folks have about anything that we talked about today or any any other career related topics about actuarial work or about AIG um, open forum? Um, about the second part to the um, case study question, oh, that would be, that's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, we said that that would be like an expected value kind of problem. Yeah, you take and, the, go ahead. Yeah, and, expect, and then you like, um, you get it to where it's what you want, 80%. Right, so you calculate the expected value of the claim based on the experience you've seen, right? Well, that, that, yeah, and, and then you uh, and then you just back into a premium would, the premium would need to be 80%, 80 of the premium would equal that expected value of claim. And the, if I if memory serves me, and it rarely does, I think I got twenty five dollars. But of course, I might have whoopsie that as well. So I think it was twenty five dollar premium. Anyone else get that? It was twenty twenty dollar expected claim, and I probably whoopsie that one too. Real, real good showing for me today. <laughs> All right, any other general questions? General 
questions about our actuarial program. I know we've done this a few times before, so I just want to make sure folks, I think this is our last time with you all for this camp, so um, want to make sure folks have time to ask questions. So maybe not relevant to conditional probabilities, but I have one question about predictive modeling and time series forecasting. How do you use this uh, time series forecasting in your, uh, I mean, to, for example, to price insurance or this kind of stuff? Time series specifically, I don't use that uh, specifically all that often. Um, you know, we are we are usually trying to predict something at a, cer a certain point in time and not sort of over you know, over time, um, you know, like we, we basically have sort of one event, which is for underwriting anyway, which is what I spend most of my time on. We, we have one event, which is they apply for insurance. We get almost all our data at that point. And then we kind of don't really have any options after that point to do it. Um, I know other, you know, like, you know, PNC, I think does more time series type work. Um, I, I am not as familiar with that. So I, I probably shouldn't try to say anything on it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to go. I have a class to teach in just a few minutes, um, but I do want to thank everyone for uh, the presentation. Uh, it was great. As always, you guys are amazing and we really appreciate uh, your help. So I, I don't mean to like tell you to wrap it up or anything, uh, you guys carry on without me, but uh, I, I do need to exit. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. All right, it sounds like there are any more questions. I know everybody's just coming back from break, so getting out of the brain fog. All right, I guess, have you all been kind of going through, did you all have time off from the camp over the last, over the holiday, a few days off? Yeah, we had a, a few days, yeah. Gotcha. Good stuff. Well, hopefully this was helpful to everyone um, and hopefully we shared some insights that you did not have before. Um, I think I could probably speak for most of the folks on the on the phone. If, if you all have things that you want to discuss or reach out to us about, um, Ty can probably get you our contact information, connect with us on LinkedIn, that kind of thing. Um, we're happy to answer questions for you all. And, and we're here because we want to see you all be successful and hopefully um, steer you towards an actuarial career. Uh, but thanks for the for the time and allowing us to share with with you all today. Thank you all. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Oh, Brandon, I just wanted to add one thing uh, before everybody leaves. Um, thank you to the students who attended today. Um, I wanted you to just, if, if some of this stuff didn't make sense today, that's okay. Some of you may be looking at this material for the first time in preparation for your first SOA exam. And, you know, I hope that you found this session helpful. I thought that it was great. I thought that Doug and Brandon and everyone else did a terrific job trying to help you make connections between the material that you're learning and how you can apply it in a real life situation. Um, I think that as you continue with the exams, you'll be able to make those connections more as you, if you're working as an actuarial student, hopefully at AIG, and you're going through some rotations and you're passing exams, with the later material, you'll definitely see more parallels. It was a little bit challenging with uh, the probability exam, but I think that the group did a great job. So thank you again to everyone. Um, I'd just like to say that um, a lot of career presentations can be overwhelming, but um, I thought y'all did a good job. I didn't find it overwhelming exactly. and um, it kind of solidified that like this is what I want to do. So thank you for that. All right. Thanks. Mission accomplished. We got one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can quit today. I'm, I've, I've succeeded now. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah. But thanks, everyone. See you all in the future, hopefully. Take care. Good Thank luck, you. everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Hey, hey Ty, how are you? Hey, I'm fine. <laughs> hey, let me ask you a question. Sure. So, how has the attendance been normally? Do you because I noticed like we had pretty much like six students attend today, and yeah. we have 12 that signed up. Um, I think the last time I checked in, we had quite a few students that attended. So I'm wondering, is it just because we're coming off the break? That we had so few students attend this session today, or is it because because like these are the same six students that have been pretty much diligent in attending? Did the other ones fall off kind of early? I need my first half with about six showing up regularly. Really? Yeah. Guys, just find that so weird. Um, the first three days or so, I had a couple more, but then I ended up. I think the second week it was just those six. Hmm. Yeah, so about six students students are not showing up, right? Wow. Which which ones? Basically the ones that that, that didn't show up today. Um let me see. Because um, um Christian, Travis, they were there. Right. So uh, Tree Andrew. was here. Yeah, Tree was here on and Michelle. They were in today, right? The if yeah, I, I those, think um, so those names were the ones that I ended up with there yes were, um, and six people at the end of the and then time. Zach Zach was there yeah, yeah also. Travis mm -hmm. and Audrey yes does Christian Upshaw's uh attend Christian uh Christian that name sounds familiar yeah Upshaw um yeah he was here today really uh, I'm looking at Christian's name in the chat box. Okay. Cool. Okay, so seven then. So Audrey is she attends. So this is the issue. The issue is what I want to know from y'all. I have one, two, three, four, five. Five people that received um the AIG scholarship and only three attended the meeting today do y'all has Maritza Hernandez and Mabel Asari have they attended those names sound familiar to you um they were there for the first week did not come back the second week okay so um, I, I think maybe Maritza may have showed up one day one, one day week. okay so I I need you guys, if you don't mind, to reach out to those two. The others I'm concerned about, but not as much as these two. I'm concerned about these two because they received the scholarship, but they're not showing up. Right. And so that's a problem. Because <clears throat> a reason why I know it's an issue <clears throat> is because Maggie contacted me directly during the event and she was like is this the normal attendance and I like I said from my perspective from what I remember it was the attendance was large we had like almost everyone there the first day what we had like 11 the first day yeah yeah and then I think that um, and then the other the, event even, that we had go ahead even that first day um a lot of them said that they were going to miss a couple of days. Okay. Um, but then, uh, even with the days that what did you what did you say their names were? Maritza and, yeah, Maritza and Mabel. Um, even the days that they were there, I didn't see them participating. Um, they were in 
uh, you know, one of the breakout rooms, but they weren't contributing at all. So I'm not even sure if they were really there. Gosh. So now I'm wondering, like, <laughs> I mean, you, my, this is my concern. You don't want to tell students during a pandemic, hey, uh, you, need, you need to pay us $300 because you, had, you didn't attend. Right. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to do that. Um, so we need to try to get them to attend at least the second half. I don't know if that requires me reaching out to them and saying, hey, you know, we've noticed, and that's probably what I'm going to do. You know, we've noticed that you haven't been attending. You know, please keep in mind that AIG has paid for you to attend this camp. You know, and I don't want to have too much strong language right. or, or words in the email by by threatening somebody because i'm not gonna do that <laughs> i mean look who knows what has happened over the break who knows they could have started the camp and maybe somebody in their family passed away from covid who knows right so but i i think i'm just gonna probably reach out to them and say hey you know we've noticed that you haven't been participating could you let us know why is it is it you know something that happening within the camp are you not prepared or you know, uh, is it non-academically, you know, related issues? I, that's probably what I'll do. Oh, and, yeah. And, um, I'll stop, we should stop recording, I think. Oh, yeah, don't. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think. Did, can you I stop mean... recording? <laughs> that dog! Oh, shit. Okay, I will cut this. I mean, if I can. Can we? It, I can edit it because I have iMovie, I think. Yeah, yeah I can edit it. God, dog, it stop. What the do? No, I got to save to the cloud. Shoot. Sorry, just stop.